Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to this lecture number 4 on the course on human behavior which is a MOOCs run course. Now as I have been telling you throughout the past 3 lectures, the course will focus on studying behavior of humans and how do are you going to do that? We are going to do that using the science of psychology. So basically this course is focused on psychology. Now before we start. Uh, this lecture, what I will do is I will do a quick recap of what happened in the last 3 lectures and since this is lecture number 4, so our recap is in place. First lecture, we started off by looking at the definition of psychology, what is psychology and what it, what it does and what it studies and what is its basic subject matter and then we focus slowly on to the history of psychology, what is psych uh, the history, how does it start and then we focused on 2 branches. Uh, from which psychology comes in, one was philosophy and the other was uh, physiology. We also focus those questions of philosophy which is carried on by psychology. For example, the existence of the mind, the existence of the soul and uh, the existence of how this soul and mind interact to turn out to be behavior, questions like whether people are born uh, with some uh, efficiencies, with some abilities or that nurture which is the environment in which they are, they uh, the environment puts those abilities in people. So those kind of questions and those kind of uh, uh, thoughts and topics was what was the focus of the first lecture. With that we also looked at primary schools of psychology. So not only looking at philosophy and physiology as the originator of psychology, we also looked at some schools of psychology starting with structuralism where we looked at psychology from the point uh, viewpoint of how human behavior can be explained as its basic structure in terms of the physical and the psychological world. Then we looked at functionalism which said that the behavior is since it is adaptive in nature, if you want to study human behavior, you have to actually see it into action. The third kind of field that we saw was behaviorism which said that human behavior is basically an association and it is a conditioned response and so whatever people do uh, is uh, in response to a particular stimulus is actually kind of a reflex. So there is no thinking, there is no problem solving, there is no mind in between and that is what the behaviorist talked about. And then we looked at fields like psychoanalysis and uh, positive psychology and that kind of a uh, thing. So, so in psycho, uh, basically in psychoanalysis uh, what was talked about was the that psychology comes from or the human behavior comes from uh, basic unconscious processes, basic hidden desires which people have. And then we also talked about gestalt psychology which was a field of psychology which is a branch of psychology which said that if you want to study human behavior, you have to study the behavior in terms of its form which basically means that the actual behavior is composed of so many other behaviors. So you have to study the whole behavior and part behavior. Uh, in separate ways and then you can actually study the human behavior. Past that we looked at new branch of psychology, for example, uh, we looked at uh, cognitive neuroscience, we looked at psycho uh, linguistics and uh, some and, and the field of neuropsychology. So that was what was the subject matter of the first lecture. In the second lecture we started off by looking at some viewpoints of looking at human behavior. So within psychology we have different viewpoints, we have the biological viewpoint, we have the cognitive viewpoint, we have the behaviorist viewpoint and uh, we have the subjective viewpoint, psychodynamic viewpoint and so there are seven, five, 4 or 5 viewpoints uh, which we actually looked at and uh, we decided or we, we evaluated one particular behavior using these viewpoints. So basically how one particular behavior can be explained by different different viewpoints in psychology. Further to that, we also looked at some 21st century uh, fields in psychology. Uh, 
which was the newer fields which came up with the in uh, coming up with the newer machines and how behavior should be studied. Then uh, towards the end of the second lecture we looked at experimental methods of doing psychology and we started off by looking at the experimental method where a variable is manipulated in some way and so uh, and its effect on some other variable is studied and so we establish a cause and effect relationship and that is what is called experimentation. So we took an example of the hot beverage and, and looked at how this hot beverage is supposed to affect uh, academic performances and based on that I described the whole methodology of doing an experimentation. Further to that we also looked at what is observation, what is uh, the observation method of doing research, we looked at what is correlation, so correlation method of doing research and how correlation is not a cause and effect kind of a thing. So in correlations if two variables are correlated which means they are, relate, uh, they are related with one another there are no, there is no way to establish a cause and effect relationship that is what we studied in uh, that part. We also looked at some other methods of collecting data uh, in psychology or doing research in psychology for example naturalistic observation, we looked at the survey method, we looked at uh, literature reviews and we looked at the clinical method of one person. Uh, 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 one person interview method or one person data method that is the single subject design as called in psychology. So that was the focus of the second lecture. In lecture number 3 which we finished uh, in the last lecture we looked at something called sensory processes. So there we focused on what is sensory processes. Now a very important thing in psychology is to understand how the information from the external environment is grabbed and transformed into meaningful bits for people. For example, the example that I gave there is when you look at a tree through your eyes, it is not the tree that you are actually looking at. The tree is a manifestation, the tree is a reconstruction that the human brain does. So what you are actually looking at are packets of photons which are bouncing off from some object in the external environment. So the external environment uh, from in the external environment in, in terms of the physical uh, environment what actually is encoded or what actually falls onto the eye are packets of photons. Now the process which takes these photons or the system which takes these photons and converts into uh, converts it into or encodes it into um, a format which can be then later on interpreted as a tree is called the sensory process right so sensory processes are those processes which make uh, uh, or which lie as a buffer between the physical world and the psychological world and that is why it is important Further to that we looked at certain qualities of the sensory pro uh, uh, processes or sensory systems and uh, basing the eye we looked at two important uh, functions of the sensory process or two important uh, characteristics of the sensory process. We looked at something called sensitivity and we looked at something called uh, sensory coding. So uh, we, we describe what is sensitivity in terms of something called uh, the absolute threshold and differential threshold. And so what is absolute threshold? Absolute threshold is the minimum amount of stimulus that is necessary for any person or for any system or for any uh, measurement system to say that there is, there is a difference between no stimulus and yes stimulus. So can a system detect between uh, 0 stimulus to 1 stimulus is what is called absolute threshold. And then we looked at what is something called the JND or the just noticeable difference or the differential threshold. And so what is differential threshold? It is the minimum amount of stimulus or minimum energy of the stimulus that should be present so that people can say that there is a difference between between one level of a stimulus and a next level of the stimulus. So how do people detect change between two uh, between a uh, situation where a stimulus is present and a next higher level of stimulus is present and that is what is called the differential threshold. We left off uh, this particular uh, uh, question uh, with the signal detection theory. Now what is the signal detection theory? It is again a characteristics of the uh, sensory um, uh, modality and so what signal detection theory actually tells you? Signal detection theory basically tells you how people do errors and how to read those errors right and so in uh, what I explained in the last class is that any information which comes to you uh, can be in terms of signals and noises and signals refers to the important aspect of information and noise refers to the important aspect of uh, or the unimportant aspect of uh, information. I described the case of how uh, doctors read or radiologists actually read an x-ray and I tried to explain signal detection theory through that. Today what we will do is we will 
look at uh, how signal detection theory actually works and look at some parameters of the signal detection theory. So, in the last class we also explained how uh, different doctors have different criteria for saying when a particular bone is uh, fractured. So, different doctors use different kind of information or different uh, doctors have different kind of uh, uh, characteristics and parameters on which they say a bone is um, fractured. Now, liberal doctors will actually look at just one or two parameter in the x-ray and will say that the bone is fractured. On the other hand, uh, conservative doctors will take a number of tests and based on that they will say a, uh, a bone is fractured. But then both of them, the liberal and the conservative have their own uh, hit, uh, on, have their own uh, good points and bad points. The good point is that liberal doctor will actually save you from a, uh, a difficult situation. So, when he says a bone, uh, as soon as he says the bone is fractured, you might get into a bandage and that will save your life in some way. But the problem is even if the doctor if the bone is not fractured, you might get into a bandage. On the other hand, a conservative doctor will spend a lot of money for you, uh, him to say that a bone is not fractured and so you spend a lot of money and after that you come to know that the bone is not fractured and that way you have lost a lot of money. And so, both of the doctors have their own uh, problems. Now, as I said, sometimes what happens is that these parameters that the doctor use is also coupled with a, num a noise in the x-ray sheet itself. So, it might so happen that the x-ray plate had some dots to start with and so, the, how does the doctor actually decide that the x-ray that he is looking at is not the true x-ray of the patient, but an anomaly in the sheet itself is what is about signal detection theory. So, signal detection theory is the process of how doctors or how any person detects a signal or detects an information in, in, a, in, in, in an environment and how does it separate it from the noise. So, that is what, what we were doing in the last class. Now, in today we'll, uh, today's class, we will continue with what we were look, uh, looking at. So, let us first quickly uh, understand this uh, 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 definitions of what signal detection theory is and I will later on explain you what this theory is all about. So, signal detection theory has two functions or uh, two parameters, one is called the hits and the other is called the false alarm. So, what is this hit and what is this false alarm? We will quickly come back to that. We will quickly come back to what is hit and false alarm. So, this false alarm is thus uh, when a signal is falsely detected where it is only noise is what is called a false alarm. So, false alarms are situations where uh, the signal is not present and if, even if the signal is not present, people tend to say that the signal is present and that is what is false alarm. What is uh, then what is hit? Hit is when you correctly uh, are able to detect the signal from no signal situations. So, signal correctly detected, this is called a hit. For now, I will just ask you to remember this, uh, what is false alarm and what is hit. So, as I said, uh, when a doctor looks at a sheet and at a x-ray, uh, when he is when he's able to detect the fracture in the bone, this is called a hit, but then if he has, is uh, falsely saying that there is no um, uh, the bone fracture that is called false alarm. And so, depending on the external noise, what could happen is his detection will differ or his uh, identification of the bone or identification of the fact that the bone is broken will differ. So, we will come back to that for now just remember what is false alarm and what is it. So, it is correctly detecting the bone is fractured and false alarm is detecting a bone is fractured when the bone is actually not fractured. And so, if you increase the hit, the false alarm will increase. Now, let us try and understand in terms of the liberal doctor and the uh, conservative doctor. Now, in terms of the liberal doctor, he will just use one or two characteristics to say that the bone is fractured and so, uh, he tends to always say that uh, the bone is fractured. And so, what will happen is at times when the sheet or when the x-ray plate has some external noise in the sense that it has some mark uh, to start with when the x-ray x-ray was taken then in this case if he increases the hit if he is too liberal what will happen is not only the hit will increase which means that not only the times that he detects the fracture will increase also a number of times he will be falsely saying that a uh, a fracture is there. So, not only heat will increase, a false alarm will also increase which means that if he is always saying that there is a fracture if, if with one or two parameters, the chances that uh, we detect a fracture, accurately detect a fracture will, will increase and also the chances that when he incorrectly detects a fracture that will also increase. Now, in terms of the conservative doctor what will happen is he takes a lot of tests and based on that he says that uh, there is a fracture and so in this case what happens is, so he very, diff in, with very number, with very many 
many number of parameters, he says that there is a fracture. So, if the heat decreases, if he takes a lot of time or a lot of parameters based on that, he says the fracture is there, the false alarm also decreases so that the error that he creates will also be less. So, that is the definition of what in false alarms is. Now, sensitivity of a sensory organ indicates by differences in heat fits and false alarms. So, how sensitive a a system is or how sensory uh, or, or uh, a sensory organ is is defined by and so this sensitivity is called d dash is actually the difference between hits rate the rate of hits minus the rate of false alarm so sensitivity of any system is dependent on the rate of hits and the rate of false alarm and similarly there is another thing which is called beta which is called the bias of a system and so, sensitivity and bias which is the next thing to come to. So, usual useful characteristic of a signal detection analysis allows processes of detecting stimulus to be separated into two numbers, one representing sensitivity to signals and the other representing bias uh, in stating signal present. So, bias is how conservative or liberal. So, the fact that a person is conservative or liberal is what is the basis of defining the bias. So, bias is how conservative a person is or how, uh, how liberal a person is and d dash is looking at how many hits you are doing and how many false alarm you are doing. So, do not worry, we will try and explain it to you. Now, remember the candle experiment that we did. So, in that experiment what was there was, there was a candle and so that was lit and so people were put in a dark room where a single candle was there and I will keep on adding the candle one to one. The job of the person was to tell when he sees the light. Now, it so happens as I said that there is something called mental noise. There is a lot of noise in the brain and so because of that individuals or human beings are, uh, it is very difficult for them to detect zero uh, light. Right? So, from 0 light to 1 light and so it happens that there is since there is a lot of noise in the in the brain in itself, it might take uh, one or two extra candles to be lit before they actually say that they see light and so this response keeps on different. Now, if that is what it is, if, if the, uh, the idea that if uh, neural noise is there and human beings are not, not very good at detecting uh, change from 0 to 1 in terms of detecting absolute thresholds, what should be done? And so, a method was designed in which method what happened is in some of the trials there was no light to start with and in some of the trials there was a light to start with and so human beings were or people were put in an experiment where they had to say that they see the light. Now, if human beings are able to detect light when no light is present that is called the false alarm right and that is called a noise or uh, in, in a noise detecting a signal in a noise and in situations when people are able to detect no light when a light is present that is called a false alarm right. So, when uh, there is uh, there, there is uh, so there are it, it actually makes four different parameters. So, let us try and plot this particular thing or uh, plot this thing and try and understand what signal detection is already or uh, uh, signal detection the theory is all about. So, basically there are four things in our in, in our experiment there are four things. One, so I have two conditions no light number one yes light number and then I have two responses to it. I have yes, I see light and no, I do not see light. So, let us make a simple table. This is my physical stimulus in terms of light present or not and this is my psychological stimulus which is if I see light or not. So, four conditions can occur as you can see the condition this is the physical condition and this is the psychological condition. So, a simple experiment in some trials I have the light sometimes I, uh, I do not have the light and the subject has to tell whether I see the light or not 
in all the conditions. So, four things can happen. Light is present, no light is present. I say yes, I see a light and I see no, I do not see a light. So, again and emphasizing what it is actually about, we did a simple experiment, we do a simple experiment to find how sensitive a system is and in this case what happens is, in some trials I have the candle and the subject has to detect whether he sees light or not. In some conditions I do not have the candles, there is absolute darkness and the subject is asked to told or tell whether they see the light or not. Now, the it, four conditions arise out of it. One, the subject tells that he sees the light, other the subject tells that he does not see the light and this is called the psychological domain. On the physical domain, there are trials in which there is light and there are trials in which there is no light and so this is the physical domain, this is the psychological domain. If the light is present and the subject says yes, he sees the light, this is called a hit, right. If the light is present and subject says there is no light, what happens is miss the light is present and the subject is not able to detect it, it is called a miss. If no light is present and the subject says that he sees the light, it is called false alarm. Here there is no light and the subject is able to still tell the light and then there is no light and the subject also responds no, I do not see the light, it is called a correct rejection and this is the easiest explanation of what signal detection theory is. So, basically four parameters, physical stimulus present or not, psychological uh, stimulus saying yes or no. Now, why does this all arise? What, what is the need of all this? The reason is that the physical stimuluses are constant, but the psychological stimulus which is basically psychological I see the light and I do not see the light is governed by your mental noise. So, at times you might see the light, at times you might not see the light and the reason by that happens is because you have mental noise. So, four different things can happen. Now, if as you can see, if you increase the heat, the false alarm will also increase. If you tell that you see the light or if you um, are some, so what I do is, as you try to increase heat, the false alarm will try to increase and so sensitivity of a system is explained in terms of heat rates minus false alarm rate sorry hit rate minus, so it is minus here false alarm rate. Now, very simply speaking, if we plot these curves, these are the responses that the subject have. If we plot this curve in terms of your internal noise and the probability of you saying that I see a signal or probability of you saying that I see a light, I will get curves like this. So, I will have two curves to start with. I will have a curve like this which is called the noise curve, right? And this is called the noise curve. Or I will say light absent. Now, on this axis, I have <coughs> internal noise. I have another curve which is called the signal curve or light present. So, along this curve, if you look at it, along this curve, I have no light present, physical stimulus is not present and along this curve, I have light present. So, it is called the signal plus noise curve actually because there will be inherent noise uh, in the in the system and so it is signal plus noise curve. Now, it is an interesting case, right? This is very interesting case. On this axis, I have the internal noise and on this axis, I have the probability of saying yes or accuracy, probability of you making a decision. That is what on this axis is. Now, the interesting thing that you have to look here is that this internal noise is called the bias or it is called the beta value. What is this? Now, uh, remember the experiment that we did with doctors. Now, some doctors are liberal and some doctors are conservative. The more liberal a doctor is, the more number of stimulus, uh, the more number of stimulus trial has to come in for him to say yes, which means that with one or two candles, he will not say that he see the light. He will require at least four, five, six or eight candles for him to say yes. 
and that happens because the internal noise or the characteristics that he uses for making this decision is, is higher, more number of parameters he will actually look at. Now, if a doctor is liberal, then what will happen is with a very few uh, trials or with a very few candle, he will say that he see the light. Now, why that happens is because the mental noise in this case, in his case is low. If the mental noise is high, then the criteria will be more conservative. If the mental noise is low, then the criteria will be more liberal. And it also depends upon people's criteria. How much, uh, how, how much evidence do you want to say that a particular uh, stimulus has occurred or a particular event has occurred. Now, <coughs> the point at which you start saying yes and no, right? That point, or uh, in our case, the point at which you start saying yes and no is what is called the beta value, and that that, that decides how the uh, hits and false alarms will actually function. So, if I'll just have to move it here because what has happened is that the rubber is not working here. So, see, so I'll just remove this from here and remove this part from here. Again, start with uh, the pen, and so this is my curve for noise, and this is my curve for signal, and so this is my beta values, which basically means that if this is my zero noise and this is my five noise, which means that I need five. At least my criteria has five parameters. Only after five parameters, I'll say that I see uh, the the light or I see the uh, bone broken. Now I can also have these parameter values here, beta values here. This uh, beta values are called the bias. And so if I if I move the, the more I move this curve or this line from here to here, the more liberal I'll become. And the more I move this curve from here to here, it will become more conservative. Now, the thing is, if you look into it, these are the two curves. So, this is the noise curve, right? And so, the point of the noise curve when there is no signal present, right? So, this part when there is no signal present, and you also say no, that a, because you are saying no from here to here, so you say no, this is called a correct rejection. This is where a signal is present and you are saying no, the signal is not present and this is called the false alarm. This is where the signal is present and you also say the signal is present. So, noise here and you are saying yes. So, this is my false alarm. This is my miss signal is present you are saying no this part you are saying no but the signal is present as you can see this curve is here so signal is present this here the noise is present plus the signal and you are saying yes so this is called the false alarm and this is called the hit so four parts this part is called the hit this whole part this is called the false alarm because your noise is present with the signal and you are saying still the signal is present or that you can see the light in this part there is noise present since this is the criteria because above this you will say yes and below this you will say no. So, you are saying no, but signal is still present this is called miss and here you are saying no and the signal is also not present because this is a noise curve and this is called a correct rejection. So, four things to be looked at this is what it is. Now, look at for looking at sensitivity and bias, so beta is called the bias. Now, bias as I said is dependent on how much characteristics or how much parameters do you actually require for saying yes to something, for saying yes that the signal is present or for saying yes the particular event has happened and that depends upon, so many doctors will as in the doctor example they will require a number of parameters, they will take blood test, they will take this, that, that, 5, 7 tests and based on that they will say yes. Other doctors are there will just look at the x-ray and say yes the bone is fractured and so they are liberal and so this bias is actually a measure of the liberal and conservative a doctor is. That liberal and conservative is determined by how many parameters do we require to say yes a signal is present which in this case is yes the bone is fractured. Similarly, sensitivity of the system which is d dash is dependent on the hits rate how many times you are correct 
minus the false alarm rate how many times you said you were correct but then there was no signal to be determined how many times so uh, the sensitivity in terms of the popularity of the doctor so how is the doctor popular the, the doctor who is popular is who has higher number of detections with lower number of false alarms lower number of wrong detections right so as you increase the heat the false alarm also increases so you have to optimize this now uh, there there are a lot of things to be studied here there are a lot of variations of the signal detection theory but we'll leave it here and this is i hope you understand what is signal detection theory uh, we can explain this or we can extend this idea of signal detection theory into looking at what liberals are and how to move this curve from one side to the other side and how uh, how the situations happen when the two curves are superimposed on one another and that kind of a thing or a roc curve but we'll leave it at here so for your information what what happens is detecting a signal or detecting uh, something in the environment is uh, influenced by the sensitivity of the system and this sensitivity of the system is dependent on how many times you are correct and how many times you are falsely saying you are correct the lesser the value is the higher the so the higher the sensitivity is and also in terms of beta of how conservative and how uh, liberal you are in terms of how many parameters do you take if you take more number of parameters you will never be famous if you take lesser number of parameters you will be famous but you have to be more accurate and so liberals with a high with a high sensitivity are always famous doctors so we'll end the discussion here and that's that's how uh, this uh, basically hits false alarm and uh, the signal detection theory actually works so moving on the second part or the second characteristic of any uh, sensory organ is called sensory uh, coding so the first part was how the sensory system really works and what are these characteristics the next part is how the what is the biological phenomena through which the detection is encoded into the uh, human brain uh, the sensory system actually takes in a signal and it detects a signal and this this signal which is detected is passed on to the branch of neurons into the uh, into the brain so how does that process goes in or how does uh, the the what is the biological process behind encoding these signals or encoding these environmental stimuli is what is called sensory coding so there are two fundamental issues for sensory systems one how to translate incoming physical information and then how to encode aspects of physical information to corresponding neural representation so this kind of problem of sensory encoding of how to encode sensory information has a two fundamental is issues to look at so the first issue is how to translate incoming information what is the way and this is called transduction so an incoming information is first translated into of uh, incoming physical information is first translated into a pattern or into a signal which the brain can understand that happens in terms of the neural responses that happens in terms of the how the nerves fiber uh, nerves fire and how to encode aspects of physical information and so uh, there are some some physical aspects of the of the uh, incoming information so generally uh, this process of translating incoming in physical information really works in terms of how neurotransmitters or how receptors really work so then then the most uh, sensory systems have something called receptors and what these receptors do is these receptors take in physical information or when in physical information fall on these receptors these receptors actually convert this physical information into neural information or neural impulses and these neural impulses and are then translated back to the brain back to the uh, areas of the brain which actually process it and then they understand uh, what kind of physical information is uh, is coming for example the light can only so if if i uh, if i send a bunch of air pressure or uh, uh, into the ear uh, the, into the eye it will not be able to encode it because eyes are not specialized to encode uh, air pressure but then if i send send a bunch of neurons uh, sorry photons onto the eye then it will be able to register it and this will be uh, sensed off or this will be encoded as light or this will be encoded as sight and that is what the eye is all about so that is how the translation of physical information happens and how encoding specific aspects of physical information so there are two uh, spe uh, specific uh, aspect of physical information that has to be uh, looked at one is called the intensity how much of the physical information is there and other is called the quality how better 
right so what is the quality of the physical information and what is the intensity how bright and how dark it is and in terms of quality how colorful it is kind of that kind of a thing in terms of the visual information so what is the quality of the signal and what is the intensity of the signal is what the sensory organs are, are dependent on now specialized cells called receptors specialized neurons detect stimulus uh, and pass an electrical signal to connecting neurons through the cortex where the electrical signals result in conscious sensory experiences. So, as I said what happens is that the specialized cells that, that are there in your sense organs, in your sensory organs, you have something called specialized cells which are called receptors. Now, these receptors they react to physical information. So, the eye has a retina and these retina has specialized cells which are called the photovoltaic cells. So, when photons pass on from the iris of the eye and I will just show you how that really works. So, it passes on from the lens of the eye and it falls onto the retina. The retina when it interacts with the photon, it sends a mini signal, a miniature signal, a change in electrical current through the uh, photoreceptors to the uh, area of the uh, brain which is called the occipital area and this area then encodes this or this reads this. So, how are these uh, this uh, photoreceptors, how do they send the signal? There are specialized neurons uh, which carry these small changes in electrical current from the photovoltaic cell or the photovoltaic receptors and uh, in, in the retina and this signal is carried back to through the through the medium of neurons they are carried back to somewhere in the occipital cortex. In the occipital cortex these signals are then reconverged or they are reinterpreted in terms of what do you see and what you do not see. It is a very simple version of looking at it that is how uh, signals are passed from the specialized from your uh, uh, sensory organs onto the uh, the area of the brain which makes conscious experiences. So, as I said there are two characteristics of sensory modality that has to be uh, uh, that the, uh, uh, the sensory organ has to code. One is called intensity and the other is called quality. So, how do sense organs actually um, encode sens uh, sensitivity and uh, sorry intensity and quality? Now, useful sensory information includes intensity and quality of stimulus. Any inf uh, sensory information which passes on which falls onto the sensory receptors, they have two qualities one is of intensity and the other is of quality. So, how does the sensory system encodes intensity and quality that is the question. Now, primary means for coding intensity of stimulus is why the rate of neural impulses generate generating intensity greater firing rate and greater firing rate generating perceived magnitude of stimulus. So, how does the eye actually encode bright light versus dim light. Now, as I said the eye is made up of something called a retina, a retina falls at the back and what is the retina specialized in? The retina is specialized in certain receptor cells which are called the photovoltaic cells right and so these photovoltaic cells or in, in, in terms of the eye it is called the rods and the cones. These photovoltaic cells are named as rods and cones. Now, cones are the one which actually see color and rods are the one which cannot see color they see black and white and there is a primary distinction between that. So, this photovoltaic cell. Now, what is a photovoltaic cell first of all let me explain you that. You would have seen clocks, musical clocks uh, which actually turn off and turn on the music depending on whether it is day and night. Now, that is a simple example of photovoltaic cell. At the heart of this system is a photovoltaic cell. What does the photovoltaic cell do? When a, when a light photon enters or hits the surface of a photovoltaic cell, it registers it and it sends a signal to the musical uh, clock to actually ring. But during the night there are no light particles, there are no photons and so when no photons fall on this cell they do not sell, do not send any signal to the musical instrument to go on and off and that is why when you switch off the light these musical clocks, clocks do not work. Similar to that are rods and cones which are at the retina and what these rods and cones actually do is they look at the intensity of light they look at the light number of photons which are falling on them and send this signal back to the occipital cortex through medium of certain neurons.